What is the church? If somebody were to ask you that, would, could you explain what the church is? You know, I know that I used to say, well, I'm going to church. I always thought that this building was the church. And I've said before, this building just keeps the elements off of us. Keeps the sun from shining on us. Keeps us cool in the summer. Keeps us warm in the winter. This is just a building. This is not the church. You are the church. Signs along the highway that say what's missing in church. And the, and the two uh, letters in the middle of the word church is you are. That's what's missing. You are. Because you are the church. You're the church. If you'd ask a, a group of people what the church is, you'd probably get as many opinions as there are people. Even Christians have a lot of different ideas about the church and its function. And I think it's important that we examine what the Bible has to say about God's design of the church. If we don't understand what the church is supposed to be, we certainly can easily drift off course and become something that the Lord never intended his body to be. Wonder sometimes how many different churches and what they meet and what they talk about. Churches all across this land meeting for whatever purpose it is. For some, church night might be bingo night. Maybe it's donuts and refreshments. You ever been to a church that did that? I was. Boy, that was strange. I was visiting that church, and they're having refreshments. I thought, well, I took care of that business this morning, you know, before I got to church. I had my donut and coffee before I got to church. It's, you know, people make a lot of different things of the church, but what is the church? What's the function of the church? Is it the function of the church to reach people? To reach those who are unsaved? To reach those who don't know Christ as their Lord and Savior? That's one of the functions of the church. Do you know where the word church is first mentioned in the scriptures? We read it, Matthew chapter 16. Our Lord makes mention of it. And he said there, if you're now there in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church. I want you to notice he called it his church, my church. It's not Roger's church. It's his church. I know sometimes we call the church by the pastor's name and say, well, it's over there at Brother Bob's church or over there at Brother Steve's church. Jesus said, it's my church. It's my church. And the gates of hell will not overpower it. The church belongs to Jesus. It is he who takes the full responsibility of building and protecting it and empowering it with the Holy Spirit. It isn't a man-made project. But our, our Heavenly Father designed it, and that's why it cannot fail. We have limited perspectives when churches fail, when they close their doors. We somehow think that the church failed. Well, maybe that expression of the church failed. When you become saved, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you become a member of what we call the universal church. You become a member of the universal church. The universal church is made up of Christians all over the world. From all over the world, they become a member of the universal church. There's some that become members of the church here at St. Thomas. There's others who feel they don't have a reason or, or a need to join or become a member of this local assembly. You want to have an active voice in your church or in this local assembly? You become a member of the church. But becoming a member of this church doesn't get you any closer to heaven. You understand me? People can join a church. People can put money in the offering plate. And I believe that there's many people that can do all those things and still go to hell. And still go to hell. 
They can do all the things that so-called Christians are supposed to do and still go to hell. They have a thorough knowledge of the scriptures, but yet they haven't learned to apply them in their own heart and in their own life. The church, in the New Testament, there were certain, there were churches that faced threats from false teaching. And, our, and, and the apostle Paul warned about these false teachers. In the last days, they'll have itching ears. They'll only want to hear the things that they want to hear. That's what it means. They, like to, they just preach to me smooth things. To the prophets who came and spoke of destruction and, and judgment. Those people said, no, 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 preach and prophesy to us good things. You know, that'd be like just taking a couple books of the Bible out and because they talk about the love of, of, of uh, the Lord, Goebbels will just preach about that. Well, then you're not preaching the whole counsel of the scriptures. The whole counsel of the scriptures includes all the judgments. Uh, why, why do you suppose the Lamentations of Jeremiah isn't put it in the scriptures? You ever read the Lamentations of Jeremiah? How would you like if I preached a whole series of lessons on, on the, the Lamentations of Jeremiah for the next six months? Wow, that you'd love that. It's part of the scripture. I can't cut it out. I can't take a scripture and say, I don't like that. I'll just cut that out. I just won't bother with that. Doesn't work that way. The whole counsel of God includes the whole Bible. The whole Bible as we know it. The whole scriptures as we know it. There are some things I'd rather preach about than other things. But if the Holy Spirit leads me to talk about that, that's what I need to talk about. Because he holds me responsible. I'll have to give an account. Someday I will stand before the Lord and give an account of those things that I shared, those things I preached to this congregation. I will give an account. When did the church start? The church began at the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. It began at the day of Pentecost. Now, if you're going to, I'm going to take you from the book of Matthew. I'm going to take you to the book of Acts. From the book of Matthew, we're going to go to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Mm, let's see. Somewhere around... 42 would be good, or go 41. And then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common. They sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in a temple, with breaking up bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It's interesting. The Lord is still adding to the church. We might want to think that we're adding them to the, to the memberships, but we don't have no part of that. It's the Lord and the Holy Spirit that adds them to the church. We don't take any credit for any of that. I know I've been, a, I've been, I visited a number of churches that they, they want to pack the church out on Sunday. I'm not against packing the church out. I'm just, I just want those, those that pack the church out on Sunday, I want them to continue to follow in his footsteps. Don't just come to church to make sure that you're going to, you're going to break a record for that Sunday's attendant. Come because you love Jesus and you want to be part of this membership or this family. How wonderful it is. Every, each and every Sunday we gather here and we pray for one another. We hug one another. This is part of the church. This is what the church is about. Do you know what I see happening in the future? Do you know what I see coming? I see a lot of, I, I see a lot of things on the internet coming that people will join the internet church. Do you know why that'll be? Well, because it's convenient. You know, I can attend the internet church by just setting up in my bedside getting my cup of coffee, and then I'll be at the internet church. And you know why that's going to be popular? Because in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves more than lovers of God. That's why that'll be popular. I see that coming. 
You'll see seen signs where you can attach yourself to these internet churches. They'll be all over the highway. You'll see them soon. Coming to an area near you. Provides instant church service without leaving your house. You don't have to make any sacrifices. You have to make sacrifices when you have children. Can you imagine a family that has seven children getting ready for church? Hello. Now you have a couple. And sometimes that could be a task. Can you imagine getting seven children ready for church? You need church till you get there. I can tell you that right now. When you, You're going to need it. Because on the way to church, I can just imagine. Now you sit down. Sit down. Is your seatbelt on? Well, we ain't got enough seatbelts. How are you going to put enough seatbelts in seven children? Well, we got to get a van. I told you that before. You see, till you get to church, you're going to need it. You're really going to need it till you get there. I can't imagine it, but we know that's true. Many families have big families, large families. They manage it. They manage it. Wow. Well, the Holy Spirit came down at Pentecost, and the Lord added to the church such as should be saved. I also put a, a, a note into 1 Peter. I want to read it. Also in First Peter, let me get back there. Boom, boom, boom. Bear with me here a minute. Here we go. First Peter two four. First Peter two four. To whom come, to whom coming as onto a lively stone. The lively stone mentioned here is Christ. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. This is Jesus. Ye also. That's talking about us. As lively stones are built up a spiritual home, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Did you know that you are also of the royal priesthood? You are part of the royal priesthood. Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone, but you are a holy priesthood. You are not talking about the pastor. You are. According to the scriptures, you are priests. You're all priests, and you can intercede for your loved ones, for your family, for one another. You can intercede for one another. Doesn't say how old you have to be. Teenagers, you can intercede. You can pray. You're praying for one another. I used to think, boy, back when I was a teenager, I see the teenagers here, I thought, oh, Lord, don't come before I get married. Don't come before I get married. <laughs> Here I am, 66. Still hasn't come, but he has come for many. He did indeed come for many. Many are no longer here. Their residence is in heaven. I go back over and look at the church director and think about all those that are now residing in heaven. No longer have residence here. Indeed, his coming was for many, and he indeed has taken many. So you can be mediators between God and others. We're responsible for offering the sacrifices of worship. That's what we were doing in, in our hymns this morning, offering sacrifice of worship and praise to him, which is the fruit of our lips. Having confidence to enter into the holy place by the blood of Christ, according to Hebrews 10:19. We can enter the holy place. In the Old Testament, the priests could only go into the holy place once a year, and they had to have the blood from off the sacrifice to take in with them. We have the blood of Jesus Christ, and we can enter in any time we wish. Any time. Not once a year. Any time. We have boldness to enter in. You have boldness to enter in any time by the blood of Christ. Our sacrifices that we offer in worship are spiritual ones, according to Romans 12 and 1. We offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable, which is, Scripture says, your reasonable service. Offering our bodies as a sacrifice means we surrender total control of our entire lives to Christ. Are you holding back part of your life? Have you learned to give your entire life to him? Are you willing to give your entire life to him? Have you ever said, Lord, this is my life. I give it to you. I give you my life. 
Or, or are you afraid that if you, give, if you say that or do that, you may end up in the black continent of Africa? Huh? So you don't want to say that. Listen to me. God never sends you to a place you don't want to go. Unless your name is Jonah. <laughs> that was an exception. Because the people that God sent him to, he hated. Are you listening to me? God had to do a work in Jonah's heart because he hated those people. He hated the Ninevites. And God had to do a work in his life. But ordinarily, normally, God never sends you to a place where you don't want to go. Think about that for a moment. He loves you. And, and he'll give you an inclination to go some places in, in, in the world that you thought you'd never go. I'm thinking about Joyce as I see her. I'll bet years ago, if somebody would have told you you would be going to Africa, you'd have said, me? Not me. You did say that. <laughs> but what do you say now? Isn't it amazing? God gave you a special heart for Africa because when you see it for your own eyes, when you see it for your own eyes, it makes such a difference. Such a difference. You think, I wish I could do more. I wish I could give more. Come back to America and see so much of what Americans have. And I just say, we're spoiled. We're just spoiled. Because there's so many people would like just a little bit of what we have. Just a little bit. We're so blessed. We need to remember that. And we need to see that we can help others who aren't so blessed. Where was it? Oh, it was in our prayer. It was in our prayer uh, talk yesterday. Of the, was it the basketball player? That seen for his own He's seen for his own sight. He was over and seen these little kids drinking out of a mud puddle. And if you'd have looked at this basketball player, you'd have think he wouldn't have a heart at all. In fact, he'd be more like the tin man. He probably needs a heart to look at him. But God touched his heart, and he determined that we need to go over and dig wells. And how many wells was dug? 18? 47 wells were dug because he saw it for his own eyes, kids drinking out of a dirty mud puddle. And no kid should have to drink out of a mud puddle. And he determined to change that. And that's the difference it makes when you get a chance to go and see for your own eyes these people that have these situations. What a difference it makes. Uh, soon be done. The true church is composed of people who belong to God. Listen to what the, the Peter described. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. First Peter 2 9. To be chosen means that God took the initiative in our salvation. His choice wasn't based on anything in us, but only on his love. He has made us a holy nation. There is no nationality or racial distinctions in the body of Christ. We hear so much today about racial problems. But in the body of Christ, there is no racial distinctions. There is none. We're all part of the body of Christ. We're all one in him. And our citizenship is in heaven. It's not in this world. So don't plant your tent stakes so deep. Because we're not of this world. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the view. We're called a royal priesthood. We are royalty. And when Christ returns to earth as a king of kings, he will, we will rule and we will reign with him. Revelation 3 and 21. And the church's job is to proclaim the gospel. 
The Great Commission, you ever hear someone talk about the Great Commission? The Great Commission is found in the last verses of, of, of uh, chapter 28 of Matthew. Jesus came and spake to them, said, All power is given to me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. All nations. In Acts, it tells us how to get started. If it doesn't work here at home, it's not going to work in all nations. In the book of Acts, it says it must start here in Jerusalem. It must first start in Jerusalem, Samaria, and then to the other most parts of the world. If you can't get it to work here, it's not going to work in the other parts of the world. How many times do we miss somebody having difficulties or financial problems in the church? And we miss them. We miss helping them. It must start here, Jerusalem. Let's help these in Jerusalem. We'll branch out and help those in Samaria. And as the church grows, then we can also help in many other nations of the world. That's the process. I believe that's the Great Commission. That's what we're to proclaim, to proclaim his goodness. There are so many people that are walking in darkness. We need to introduce them to his marvelous light, 1 Peter 2 and 9. We exalt and worship our Lord together because we have received mercy. And so we have been entrusted with the gospel and that gospel should go forth and be able to share it with your neighbor, share it with a member of your family who still is trapped in the darkness of sin. People need the Lord. They need to hear about God's love and, his, and our Lord's sacrifice on their behalf and went to the cross. They need to hear the good news. People need the Lord. And forgiveness is possible for all who will repent and trust the Lord as their Savior and Lord. It's still not too late to repent. And it, and it doesn't matter how many different things people try to convince that they, God can't fix, God can't heal, he can't heal me, he won't forgive me. These are things that are terrible, terrible. Listen, Paul said, I'm the chiefest of sinners. I killed Christians. Don't you ever let the devil tell you that God can't forgive you. He will forgive you, and he wants to forgive you. There's nothing you've done that he can't forgive you. All manner of sin is forgivable, except blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Did you hear him? That's just what the Scripture says. All manner of sin is forgivable. We serve a wonderful God. And, and if we're not willing to forgive others, he can't forgive us of our sins. So, yes, we need to learn to forgive others who wronged us wrongfully and learn to forgive them. We need to keep our focus on him. If we don't, we'll look at nothing but the flaws and failures of the church. But the church is precious to him. And I can tell you, if you're church shopping, there's no perfect churches. There isn't any. And if you do find one, when you join it, it won't be perfect anymore. We'll be united one day in heaven. One day we'll be free from sin and we'll be unhindered in our fellowship. We won't be hindered in our fellowship with one another, nor our love and adoration to him. Would you all stand? Ooh. Hallelujah. I'm thinking page 84 would be a good one to close with. Page 84. Emmanuel, I think it should be. That is it 85? Thank you, Scott. Okay. He's looking. When you find it, go ahead and start us. 185. Amen. Father, thank you for our time together today. 
Thank you for your precious word. Help us, O Lord, to understand and know that your church is your church. And Lord, you will add to the church as you see fit. Each and every day, Lord, we pray that there'll be more added. We pray for this assembly, Lord, that there'll be others that will be added to this assembly, that we'll have opportunity to share what you've been doing in our lives with others, that they may also come out of this darkness and into your marvelous light and be able to be part of this expression of your love. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful and beautiful day. Thank you for each and every family member that's here today. We thank you for the opportunity we've had today to share your word. It's precious and it's beautiful. And Lord, we just love it and we just ask you, Lord, now to be with each and every one as we leave this place. And Lord, just give us a wonderful and blessed week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.